So uh, here we are. Um, should be talking today about uh, the international revolt against the Cold War, 1964 to 1968. Should have your midterms and grades by now. Um, and with my comments and uh, all the rest that goes with that. Uh, we have a book review coming up. I'll send you an assignment on um, uh, iLearn, um, um, indicating uh, the book review once again. Um, and I, as I've um, already let you know by, uh, by email, um, I've decided that the, uh, the book review ought to be optional. So, um, so that's, that's the way we'll do that. Um, and today let's talk about the 60s and, um, and the impact on the Cold War and um, um, what happened to Cold War liberalism and what uh, developed in the wake of Cold War liberalism or what you might say, what you might call the last stand of Cold War liberalism with Lyndon Baines Johnson once uh, um, Robert, uh, once uh, John Kennedy had been assassinated in 1963 and uh, Lyndon Johnson had taken over as president of the United States. So we should be reading Stone, uh, or should be um, watching Stone. There's a, um, um, a film on this that he has, uh, giving his own particular uh, point of view on it. It's uh, very interesting for us, a good review of facts, a lot of facts that aren't maybe aren't included everywhere. We're reading Fink for backup, uh, and we're also starting to read Max Elbaum about uh, Maoism and uh, the rise of Maoism in the world. Very interesting um, study from the standpoint of an American who is a very keen Maoist. And um, so uh, those are a number of different sources we'll have for looking at the 60s and there are a number of different things you could read on the 60s. Um, in fact, there's a kind of an ocean of literature on almost every uh, topic having to do with the 60s. Almost everything we mention, there's an ocean of literature on it. Um, uh, but what is their overall that's good? Well, you know, I like uh, Todd Gitlin's book, The 60s. And it's not very good on international politics and all the things we're interested in most in this course, but it is very good on the 60s, very good on the sensibility of the youth, uh, and especially in the United States. Uh, so uh, Todd Gitlin, he teaches at Columbia now um, and has written a lot of other stuff. But this book on the 60s, I think, um, is still... Uh, probably uh, the best uh, kind of overall study of what you might call the radicalism of the 60s. That's a good way to good way to approach the topic. All right, let's begin with the uh, whole question of um, the big confrontation we just got through talking about, uh, Kennedy versus Khrushchev, um, which we see developing around from 57 up to um, uh, 63. So there's the Khrushchev of Sputnik. It's the Khrushchev that, that is being encouraged by Mao Zedong and uh, the suggestion that the east wind is now going to prevail over the west wind and that this uh, entails not only a series of uh, revolutionary uh, victories over the imperialists all over the world uh, but it also suggests uh, ma major geopolitical victories uh, for the uh, revolutionary um, uh, powers the communist powers uh, russia at their lead mao thinks in 1957 um, uh, but also china uh, alongside. And in 1957, Mao is thinking that Khrushchev is going to give him nuclear weapons. So that the two of them, I guess you have to uh, suppose that the two of them would have stood together and as, uh, as uh, nuclear powers, maybe on the analogy of the United States and Britain, uh, stood together against the imperialists on um, almost every question that would come up on the globe that involved um, social change and uh, political uh, progress as they saw the matter. Um, and would back up, would back up the various struggles all over the world, the class and liberation struggles, Khrushchev called him in Vienna in 1961 when he was talking to Jack Kennedy, class and liberation struggles, back these up with the power of the Soviet Union and China and with their nuclear weapons, what it comes to. So um, all of this talk kind of boils up at the end, as we were indicating last time. Um, and it's kind of symbolized by Khrushchev's testing of this massive bomb, which he advertised as, uh, as 100 megatons worth of yield, the biggest nuclear weapon that had ever been tested 
Um, later on, uh, most of the historians have settled on a figure of around 60 megatons, even 60 megatons. It's just a, a colossal amount of, uh, amount of yield, and maybe three times as much as, um, as the bombs with the greatest yield in the West. What purpose could there be in testing such a weapon? What purpose other than intimidation of the West? So nuclear diplomacy is reaching its absolute high point at the time of the testing of the Tsar bomb in 1961. So then we have the Berlin crisis, uh, as we were indicating last time, when uh, Kennedy stood up to, to uh, Hrushchev over Berlin, called up the reserves, uh, prepared the world to face down um, the Soviet Union over American rights in Berlin. You know the Americans have absolutely no prayer of defending Berlin at this time, had a absolutely no prayer of defending it with conventional forces. So uh, to stand up, so to speak, to the Soviet Union means that you are threatening nuclear war uh, if the other side is going to press a conventional um, advantage. So you're going to be the ones who use nuclear, we nuclear weapons first. That's what's involved in all of this nuclear diplomacy. One has to deter something. One is not simply deterring a nuclear attack, but it's deterring conventional threat of such a magnitude that one feels that there's no other conventional force that can be put up against it. That certainly has to be the case with the Western position in Berlin. There's no way the United States, um, no way NATO could defend Berlin with conventional forces. No way. And, you know, NATO right from the beginning has never been a, um, a, a, an alliance of powers, you know, with armies raised in order to wage a, a genuinely conventional war against an aggressor. No. No, no, it's always been a nuclear alliance, and it's always had the United States nuclear weapons at it, as its, uh, I mean, you could say backup, but I mean, it's not even backup when you consider the alliance is not worth a nickel, uh, strictly speaking, without the United States nuclear weapons. And that is the point of the matter. Very clear from the time of the debate over the Lisbon force goals we were indicating in 1952, if you remember our discussion during those days. So anyhow, this is a tremendous threat that Rostov uh, represents uh, to the world. And uh, Jack Kennedy um, sized it up as a threat on the magnitude and of the, almost the same scale and character of the threat the world faced during the 30s when, with the rise of the fascist powers and Nazi Germany at their head. Well, that is the theory of totalitarianism, is it not? It is the theory that the Soviets represent some kind of related uh, thing to fascism. Communism and fascism are kind of blood brothers, strictly speaking. And, uh, and uh, strictly speaking, we have to stand up uh, to um, uh, Cold War liberalism argues that we have to stand up to the, uh, uh, to the Soviet threat the same way we stood up to the Nazi threat, to the fascist threat in the 30s. I think Jack Kennedy really breathed a lot of this air. Uh, I, I was going to say he drank deeply. I couldn't decide whether he was drinking or breathing, you know, so that was my, my metaphors. Uh, but at any rate, um, I think Jack Kennedy very much thought it in these kinds of terms. And if you look at his book, Why England Slept in um, his um, senior thesis uh, uh, published with some help from some other senior academics in, uh, in uh, 1940, way back. Um, it does give an indication of the way he thinks about these things. And uh, there is a very definite, um, how to put it, a very definite absorption of Kennedy in this theory of totalitarianism and in uh, the struggle of the Cold War is a struggle between opposites, almost the same sense as the struggle against fascism. Um, I understand this because I, I lived during this period and drank, uh, drank some of this in. In fact, quite a bit of this in. In fact, I thought exactly as, jo as Jack Kennedy did uh, about the Hrushchev threat. I thought Hrushchev was an absolute lunatic. Um, at any rate, by comparison with Stalin, a very, very sober and measured diplomatist, participant in the international system, um, 
in a way that was very, very calculated, measured, and uh, reliable and predictable. So you can't improve on that. If you have to choose an enemy, you want an enemy that, that's reliable and predictable, especially when you're talking about nuclear weapons. So um, comparing him with Stalin, it's not the same thing at all. Hushchot very definitely feels the breath of uh, Mao Zedong uh, behind him, constantly egging him on. And Hushchot realizes that he's he's got to show that Soviets are the leaders in this whole thing, especially since he's denied Mao nuclear weapons. That's the whole crux, in my opinion, of the geopolitical and, you might say, strategic, uh, in fact, better to say strate strategic than geopolitical, um, confrontation between the United States and, uh, and the Soviet Union, Hershaw versus Kennedy. And it all ends extremely well, brilliantly, brilliantly played uh, by John Kennedy. Um, Khrushchev has the world at the brink. And her block, of course, the great liberal cartoonist, is using practically the same figures he used for Dulles, dragging the world to the brink, you know, brinkmanship. He's practically using exactly the same figure for, um, uh, for Khrushchev. And I guess that's an interesting point uh, uh, to make, that Khrushchev is, in effect, ready to blow up the whole world in, in, um, um, on behalf of his... Uh, of his favorite uh, political uh, projects. And at the end of the Cuban Missile Crisis, which we've already talked about, at the end of this thing, there's this feeling that uh, the world has escaped about the closest call that it ever had. And I certainly agree with this thesis. The closest call it ever had with regard to uh, um, the actual advent of nuclear war. And that uh, while uh, Kennedy imagines himself the opponent of Khrushchev. He emerges, and of necessity, because of the, the stakes of the thing involved, he emerges as a kind of partner uh, with Khrushchev at the end of the thing. Really, that's the, that's the rational actor um, as a diplomatist, as a nuclear a diplomatist. I don't think anybody has improved on Jack Kennedy in this regard, and... Um, his actions during the Berlin crisis of 1961 and in the Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962, uh, in my opinion, cannot be improved on um, uh, in terms of what became, I don't like this phrase at all, but, but what became known as crisis management, about how to deal with a uh, political showdown in which nuclear war is threatened, in which uh, you have a very intractable enemy who's trying to steal a march on you, and that's what he had with Khrushchev. In, uh, in Cuba in 1962. I don't think you can improve on Kennedy's uh, performance under these circumstances. And that's, I think, uh, I think the way the world looked at it at the time. This is the famous David Levine cartoon, which I indicated in my talk on it last time. <laughs> Kennedy astride horses <laughs> going in opposite directions, <laughs> the guy who couldn't do anything. Uh, he did really uh, seem to be a miracle worker, a wonder worker. Uh, and um, this other cartoon, European uh, cartoon, which has um, the, uh, the leaders of the world looking at Jack Kennedy to see what Jack Kennedy has actually achieved in the Cuban Missile Crisis. I mean, not only has he achieved a victory in the sense that Khrushchev has had to remove the nuclear IRBMs, from the nuclear missiles, the IRBMs from Cuba, but also, and this is the most important part, uh, Kennedy has imposed a kind of new order upon the Cold War, an order of detente, you'd have to say. Uh, the easing of uh, tensions between the, between the powers. So Kennedy is not only a brilliant, brilliant stand-up diplomatist when it comes to uh, the crisis that involves the use of force, not only is he great in that way, but he's got an overall political vision of the whole thing, which looks to the lessening of nuclear tensions, ultimately. Does not look toward victory. Well, this would be his victory, but it does not really look toward the subjugation and humiliation of the opponent. Um, but it looks toward a lessening of tensions that, strictly speaking, you have to say the end of the Cold War.
the end of the Cold War. That's certainly the way uh, a lot of people in Europe, General de Gaulle for the French, said this, frankly, the Cold War is over uh, because of what Kennedy achieved in the Cuban Missile Crisis. And then what follows that, the Test Ban Treaty of 1963, um, he has, in effect, won the Cold War and ended the Cold War, uh, but not not with the United States dominating the Soviet Union. He's only made the world safe for diversity, and that is Kennedy's conception of it. Uh, very attractive, you can imagine, uh, the generations of people who knew Jack Kennedy, who voted for Jack Kennedy, who watched all of this, who were scared to death by nuclear war, and who were also worried about this character, Hershkov, and his uh, inability to look at nuclear weapons with a sense of how to put it, his, uh, common sense, uh, uh, prudence, ordinary prudence, and was a very reckless character with these things. Um, this is the way the world looked uh, at JFK. He was the great, great lawgiver um, of, the, of the future post-Cold War era. Well, at any rate, the Cold War reduced to the level of detente. If you just abstracted relations between the United States and the Soviet Union, uh, from this point on, we're going to be talking about all sorts of other things, and the Vietnam War and all sorts of other things. But if you took that out of the equation, the United States gets along with the Soviet Union rather well during this period. There's a feeling that somehow uh, the relationship is only going to ripen as they become truly equal as powers. The Soviets are going to have to build a lot of missiles to catch up to the United States, but there's no way to stop this. You can't outbuild them. Um, and there, anyway, that's the feeling. And the United States will be stopping, as we'll indicate, at 1,000 ICBMs. 1054 was the number, magic number. Um, and it will wait for the Soviets to achieve their 1054. We'll talk about how that all worked out. But that's for a later day. This is the, um, this is the end of the Cold War and uh, the promulgation by Kennedy of a a world uh, that is going to be made safe for diversity. So made safe for diversity. What does that mean, made safe for diversity? We already talked about this. So I'm uh, guilty of repeating myself, but perhaps some, it bears repetition. The idea that from this point on, uh, we're going to think of communism as something that we're not trying to get rid of. If it disappears, it disappears, of course. But uh, uh, we're not going uh, consciously taking risks with nuclear weapons and doing things of that nature to destroy communism. We're going to try to live with communism in the world, try to civilize it, try to influence it in various ways. And of course, there are many ways in which it could be influenced. Very open, you might say. Communism is very, very open to influence by Cold War liberalism. I would offer that as a formula. Communism very open to the influence of Cold War liberalism. If only it's approached in the right way. Kennedy seems to have found the answer. It's certainly not groveling. You might even say it's not the attitude of Adlai Stevenson. Some people have argued this. I think this is wrong. Not the attitude of Adlai Stevenson, that we've been too warlike, and we have to use diplomacy, we have to, you know, speak and argue and plead and blah, blah, blah. No, 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 no. This is the attitude of uh, stern confrontation with the Soviets and preparation to go to the brink. This is the most Brinkman-like, Dulles-like nuclear diplomacy you can, you can think of. Uh, with this edge on it, this smooth edge on it, uh, that recognizes we're not trying to humiliate the opponent. We just want the opponent to recognize the futility, the futility of nuclear threats. And in a sense, it is nuclear diplomacy designed to negate and abolish nuclear diplomacy. So all this, the 
great achievement of Jack Kennedy. What a guy. What a guy. Um, what a leader. And so I, speaking this way, I'm not only indicating my attitude at the time, uh, but I think I am also uh, uh, reporting uh, accurately on the general attitude in the rest of the world at the time. That, uh, Jack Kennedy was, in effect, the great lawgiver to the world. He was going to create a, a post-Cold War order. We were going to live together on this planet. So that's a, uh, an enormous thing. You can't uh, overestimate the prestige of Kennedy uh, in the United States and in the world at this point. My generation of historians doesn't go down this route. They, many of them, make the argument that Kennedy is all wet about this, he's all wet about that, he's too much of a Cold War liberal. Oh, many, many complaints you can make about all sorts of aspects of Kennedy's political uh, actions, his background, and all the rest of that. Uh, many, many points to be made against Kennedy. And uh, usually they make them now, nowadays, and uh, these obscure um, the, uh, the great triumph of Cold War liberalism that Kennedy represented. So I am cutting against, I'm criticizing, I am whining about a lot of the history, especially by American, I have to say by American diplomatic historians, much of the history of this period that's been written uh, under the influence, of course, of um, the 60s, as we'll be in indicating, you get an idea of why people ended up feeling this way. But I think to say it about Kennedy, um, uh, I would criticize it um, uh, very, uh, uh, very surely. So um, a lot of you won't feel that way. You know, you'll be reading other stuff. You'll be thinking of Kennedy in a different way. You'll disagree. Perfectly all right um, uh, to interpret things the way they see best for you. But these are things to argue about and argue against if you want to. Um, and I encourage, I encourage that. Nevertheless, this is my view. And uh, we'd have an interesting discussion. Maybe we'll, as we continue, have an interesting discussion about this how to put it, this legacy of, JF, of JFK. Well, JFK didn't uh, last, though. He was taken from us. He was assassinated. 22nd of November, 1963, shot down. What? What? shot down in a motorcade. A single assassin, we're told. A single assassin firing at him from behind with a Manlicher Carcano Italian rifle, kind of a relic of the thing. Not a, not a very good weapon. No experts have been able to fire um, rounds like this from that position where he was supposed to have been lodged in Texas Book Depository above Dealey Plaza in Texas when he fired these rounds at Jack Kennedy. That's the story we were given. And then there's a Zapruder film. A man named Zapruder happened to be standing there and took pictures of the whole thing, so we see exactly what the timing of the shots is. And uh, so we've got a certain timeline on account of this Zapruder film. And this was unexpected that a Zapruder film would show up and provide such a precise um, rubric around which to make the argument that uh, Kennedy was killed in the way he was said to be killed by J. Uh, by, um, Lee Harvey Oswald. So the Warren Commission plunged into this, as you already no doubt know. And uh, the Warren Commission 
maintained that it, there was no plot, no rounds had been fired at the president from the front. They all came from the rear where, Hos where Oswald was, and they all traveled exactly as was indicated by the um, by the commission, especially this one, the magic bullet, which in order to do everything it's got to do within the rubric of the Zapruder film time outlines, it has to enter Kennedy's back, fire downward, bear in mind, the Texas uh, School Book Depository is a tall building. So fire downward, then it's got to change its trajectory and go upward in order to come out right at uh, Kennedy's Adam's apple, roughly. Fire downward into his back to come out, out from his Adam's apple, uh, but then to go down again, to hit Governor Conley, who's in the front seat in the wrist, go through his thigh, then to end up on the stretcher um, as it is, um, as, as we're brought to the hospital in the bullet, uh, presumably uh, in pristine condition. Well, it's, it's withering the details of this whole thing. And I do not profess, <laughs> I do not profess to take on this entire subject of uh, who killed Jack Kennedy. And of course, and that's, it's outside my competence here and all the rest of it. But we do have to take into account how it impacted the world and world history. So that is our job. We cannot shirk that job. So that we have to deal with. Uh, but we do have to note that um, this is a story that was told about this assassination that no one has ever believed. Or I should put it this way, at no time has a majority of people who knew about this taken it at face value and, and taken it taken it seriously. There's always been quarrel about the Kennedy assassination. All right. On the one side are people are trying to actually figure it out, try to get an idea. Well, they start with this, with the magic bullet. They, they start with the idea that the Warren Commission is all wet. Then enters the idea of conspiracy. Then it's who did the conspiracy. And then it's who hated Jack Kennedy and uh, all the rest of that. And uh, so it's all the kind of things that historians would have to do. Historians can't just say, <laughs> we're going we're gonna to believe the Warren Commission because, you know, in the same way that we believe in God. No, no. <laughs> you can't. Historians don't do that. And the people from this period did not do that. They, they were curious. They had loved this man. They thought this man had really led them to the promised land politically. And uh, they were, how to put it, somewhat dis disappointed to see him end this way and didn't like the story that there was no broader plot than the action of one single person, Lee Harvey Oswald. He didn't like this idea. I guess you have to understand it. Um, so there's a great deal of this kind of discussion. We cannot go into that here. Uh, we just have to take note of it history, historically. And there are a lot of works written about this. Some of them are crackpot. Um, some of them are not so crackpot. And naturally, the people who want to defend the Warren Commission, um, they say that uh, to uh, argue otherwise uh, puts you in the category of uh, conspiracy theorists. This is a term that has come to be used for people who argue unorthodox arguments about conspiracies. Of course, there are conspiracies in history, and we, you know, can hardly can hardly miss conspiracies coming up now and then in, in history. Uh, sometimes we know, understand them, and sometimes we don't. Um, but uh, there's nothing about a conspiracy that's ipso facto false, although sometimes you'll see 
historians arguing exactly that way. Jill Lepore <laughs> argues that way in the New Yorker. It says that conspiracy theories are always wrong because of such, such a reason. Gee, <laughs> that means every, every theory about every plot in history, there never were any plots in history. How can I say something like that? It is, no, we can't say that. So there, there is a literature about this and there, it, Serious literature, serious history is, can be written like about just about anything. In fact, uh, uh, when we have to conclude that we can't know or, you know, we're at the limits of our knowledge, in my opinion, that's the best history. It tells us what we don't know, it tells us what we can't understand. So it's legit, perfectly legit to write history about this. Of course it is. And a lot of his, a lot of history has been written. Not, some of it is not legit, though. So there's good and bad history with every topic, and the same with this. Some of the stuff that is, you know, more recognizable to historians in the sense that it, you know, it does have certain evidences and certain kinds of, uh, you know, reasonings that make an appeal to the, re uh, I should say, arguments that make an appeal to the reason. Um, so there is some of that. Um, there's a lot of it that dismisses a lot of arguments that have been made or argues against them and all the rest. Um, but a recent study um, uh, makes the argument that um, uh, Kennedy had, uh, that this was done by members of the U.S. intelligence and uh, marshals a lot of very uh, powerful evidence. There's Jack Kennedy with Alan Dulles, brother of John Foster Dulles, who died in 1957, head of the CIA, but they fell out over the Bay of Pigs. Kennedy threatened to get rid of the CIA. So naturally, the hypothesis emerges, in, hypothesis emerges in, among these historians as to whether Dulles uh, wasn't the source of a plot to get rid of Jack, Jack Kennedy. Then they go into all sorts of things. Here's the, here, here are the, lead, the members of the a Warren Commission. We have all sorts of interesting things. That Richard, there's Richard Russell there who sent a, uh, a message to uh, President Lyndon Johnson that the Warren Commission's story of the assassination was all ridiculous, and he he couldn't couldn't buy it. Lyndon Johnson, he had these a record of these conversations, telephone conversations between him and Lyndon Johnson, the two of them know, knew each other well in the Senate uh, before Johnson became president. He told Russell, uh, yeah, I know it's ridiculous. I know that the Warren Commission's not right. He said, but uh, we have to do it. Otherwise, the country is going to believe the Russians did it. They're going to have a nuclear war over the thing. We have to keep that quiet. And... Uh, Apparently, he talked uh, Senator Russell into that, into going along with it. But Senator Russell thought it was absurd that, that you couldn't. Um, then it's sometimes said that the military was unhappy with the way things went at the uh, Bay of Pigs and even in the Cuban Missile Crisis. So here's to Curtis LeMay uh, for the Air Force uh, talking with JFK. Curtis LeMay, at the time of the Cuban Missile Crisis, thought a big opportunity had been missed. Thought the United States ought to maybe take on the Soviets with nuclear weapons at a moment when he didn't think their missiles were enough to, to uh, defeat the United States, that uh, perhaps we could get the upper hand over them, and that the moment wouldn't come again. And uh, it, was, it was a window of opportunity, as they like to say, um, during the Cuban Missile Crisis. A window of opportunity for nuclear war, for nuclear war. Uh, JFK had to argue against him. There's bad feeling over it, bad sense that uh, an opportunity had been missed, not only among LeMay, uh, not only with LeMay, but um, uh, among a number of uh, important military men. Then you start looking at all the people who may have had antagonisms with the president. So a lot of this literature goes into all this stuff. And, well, yes, I mean, yes. We're on a little bit different topic now. We're not exactly talking about who might have killed him, but 
who might have been glad to see him gone. That's quite a, <laughs> quite a different thing, of course, a vastly different thing. Even so, um, can they be counted among Kennedy's enemies? So oh, Roger Blah of U.S. Steel, Kennedy was trying to get the steel workers and, uh, and the steel makers, you know, to agree on a wage settlement that would be non-inflationary, that would not uh, provoke the raising of steel prices. So he was kind of, how to put it, intervening in all this process, jawboning the, uh, the negotiations going on between steel workers unions and big steel. He apparently thought he got an agreement, they got the contract they wanted, but then afterwards, big steel still wanted to raise prices. Kenny was very unhappy about that and threatened big steel, said, we'll buy from small steel companies if possible, where we'll make, we'll try to cost you money. It's an enormous crisis over this. Um, did Kennedy think, it was sometimes argued by some pundits, did Kennedy think that uh, US business could be regulated like a public utility? Is that all he thought business was? Uh, uh, what was the relationship between the state and business? Did Kennedy understand that? Um, it's a bad, um, Bad feeling in that, in that vein. Um, bad feeling in the Republican Party uh, about Jack Kennedy's great victories, of course. Of course. And naturally, uh, the Republicans, naturally their most attractive, most brilliant candidate, Nelson Rockefeller, shown here at the left, um, naturally, uh, the Republicans felt they could never beat Kennedy again in an election, and he had a brother in the government to succeed him, and who knows, they might be looking at a Kennedy administration for another 20 years, like Roosevelt. So, my goodness, these were people who probably could be counted on the roster of Kennedy's rivals, adversaries, opponents, however you want to put it, enemies. Um, and there's Nelson Rockefeller in, in an expansive mood, giving the finger uh, to someone at a press conference <laughs> who was giving him a, a, a hard time. This is in New York, founder of Lyndon LaRouche. I mean, a, a follower of Lyndon LaRouche was making some kind of argument against Roosevelt. <laughs> Roosevelt laughed, laughed at him and flipped him the digit, so to speak. Uh, so um, those were the uh, those were the a roster of enemies, and I I try to register this in order to understand why people got so radical in the '60s, and this is part of my explanation. A lot of people started out behind Jack Kennedy, and I think they would have stayed behind Jack Kennedy. I think you might even make the argument that there would not have been radicalism in the United States on the scale, certainly not on the scale that it did, that it developed, um, had uh, Jack Kennedy not been assassinated. The cruel blow, you might say, to all the liberals, and there were many in the, in, in the United States, the cruel blow of Kennedy assassination has to figure into our explanation of growth, this enormous radicalism uh, that, uh, that we see. But, thing we have to explain at the end of the end of the 60s. So at any rate, Kennedy is removed from the equation. We'll come back to this topic of assassinations later, but, um, uh, but let's drop it for now. Um, uh, Kennedy removed from the, from the scene despite himself, and another man is going to get a treatment a little bit like that, a little bit like that. Uh, Rostrov is also going to be removed from the scene. Um, against his will, uh, by the man in the middle of the picture. Um, see if my pointer is working here. Yeah, it is. Um, Mikhail Suslov. Those of you who remember my lecture on this topic will remember Suslov well. And uh, Suslov came out of the Cuban Missile Crisis with the feeling that uh, Khrushchev could not be tolerated as a leader. You can certainly understand that. 
I don't think Sisloff's position is mysterious in the slightest. Right? They would not want to march forward in a world with a a person so flaky, so uh, unpredictable as Khrushchev fooling around with nuclear weapons, sticking them in places where it obviously wasn't going to wash, it wasn't going to work to stick them into Cuba. Um, so tremendous impatience, I'm putting it very mildly, with Rushchoff. A big debate that developed immediately after the Cuban Missile Crisis. It's pretty much directed by Mikhail Sislov, the director of ideology. Sislov felt that Khrushchev was not up to it, and in the end had to arrange it. It amounts to a cabal in the leadership. This is followed very well by a book by Michel Tattoo, correspondent for the French Le Monde, uh, Power in the Kremlin, very detailed study of everything Sislov did, all the speeches he made, everything. Very, very well followed by a, the best, in my opinion, best Kremlin watcher from this period, Michel Tattoo, T-A-T-U, if you want to get hold of this book, Power in the Kremlin. Um, and, um, but at any rate, it is a cabal. And uh, Sislov uh, on the warpath, essentially, against Khrushchev, trying to remove him from power. That's the, um, the second secretary for ideology who's trying to remove the first secretary. I haven't had anything like that <laughs> in Soviet, Soviet history. So, I mean, my th theory that the Soviet Union is changing, my, uh, my thesis that the Soviet Union is changing very considerably throughout this period um, sort of uh, applies here in spades. Um, and uh, Suslov wants Rushchev to move. He's got a candidate. The candidate's in the edge of the picture. Um, to Suslov's left, your right at the edge of the picture, Leonid uh, Brezhnev, who's going to be the replacement. And Brezhnev's going to be everything that Khrushchev is not. He's uh, going to be good looking. He's going to be um, going to be careful and considerate of the comrades, measured in his decisions, subject to collective leadership. That is the key to everything. And um, not at all tempted by adventurism, subjectivism, and harebrained schemes. The famous formula in the uh, Soviet materials that they released about Rushchev from this point on. We're going to be talking about this constantly, and they always use that formula. Objectivism, uh, or excuse me, adventurism, subjectivism, and harebrained schemes. That's what Rostov represents. You can see why they feel this way. In many ways, a very accurate, very accurate way to put it. Interesting that the leadership of the Soviet Union is capable of making this kind of a change in the Central Committee. They took this thing to the Central Committee. That's where Rostov was saved. Do you remember in 1957 by Zhukov? Um, but uh, this time, he isn't saved. Well, John Malinovsky, who has replaced Zhukov, did not intervene in this thing. Suslov was able to arrange the Central Committee meeting, taking up the whole question of whether they should get rid of Khrushchev. And they read him the Riot Act for hours in a long, drawn-out meeting in which, uh, of course, they have to, you have to do this. They insist on the bandwagon in their collective meetings. Everybody's got to say something. You can't just say, sit back and say, you know, I'm a centrist. Uh, you know, I can go either way. No, no. When they're denouncing somebody and getting rid of somebody, everybody's required to get after them. So naturally, there develops this kind of a sense in the grouping um, um, of uh, where's the bandwagon going? I got to get on the bandwagon. And it's uh, sometimes the um, um, Soviet um, Participants in this have, have spoken about it and talked about the dread bandwagon when they feel it get going. Somebody is being attacked. Somebody else agrees. His uh, work has not been up to snuff. He's uh, he suffers certain limitations. Um, you know, he has not made um, topical um, um, uh, contributions to socialist construction problems of socialist construction or some other formula like that. 
they pick it up and they all jump on the bandwagon. Um, so they had a regular bandwagon against Khrushchev uh, in 1964. And at the end of it, Khrushchev knew they were going to get rid of him. And the last thing he said to them was, well, if you make me step down as first secretary, can I at least keep me in the cabinet and give me secretary of agriculture? <laughs> that, after all, is his specialty. <laughs> and uh, everybody in the room laughed. They were all laughing at him. He's the head of state. They're not going to shoot him. It's not like the Stalin days. He's going to draw a pension, going to live in Moscow, going to write his memoirs. So the Soviet Union has changed. A lot, a lot has changed. Of course, when they're all laughing at you, uh, that really is the end. I mean, you know, it's one thing to be criticized, but when, you know, when everybody's laughing at you, you, we've gone way beyond criticism. So no more Khrushchev. So now we get a collective leadership. And here, here it is with Podgorny on the far left, Brezhnev in the center, the leader, Alexei Kosygin to his left, between him and Suslov at the end, Kosygin, a, a, a economist, uh, one with all sorts of interesting economic reform uh, programs. And of course, they went nowhere. Um, I shouldn't say, of course, there was a discussion over his reforms in the early 60s, uh, but they went nowhere. Um, and then at the far right of the picture, Mikhail Suslov, the kingmaker, the real power behind the throne. Ominous Gris, people might have said of him. Well, the power behind the throne. Um, what kind of power is it? It's a power of collective leadership. And um, um, Suslov says it's Leninist. Uh, maybe that's arguable if you accept their definition of Leninism. Um, Leninist collective leadership, meaning the way it was done before Stalin, the way it was done under Lenin. Lenin was first among equals. And uh, while they thought the world of him, loved him and all the rest of it, um, when they argued with him, um, they did not run into the danger of arrest or persecution, imprisonment, shooting, anything like that. That became the norm, practically the norm under Stalin. But not at all in the period of Lenin. That's entirely unique with Stalin and bespeaks Stalin's illegitimacy in the succession. We're getting around that. Lenin, would, Lenin wanted to get rid of it. So there we have it for that. But Leninist leadership, as um, Brezhnev is now thinking of the matter, a Leninist leadership uh, revolving around Brezhnev as really uh, first among equals. And by the time he's finished in 1982, they'll be piling every sort of honor on him. He'll have every sort of celebration, saying how great he is, etc. cetera. Um, but um, he won't be throwing his weight around and uh, certainly will not be carrying out any big attacks on any of his colleagues. So he definitely represents a consensus leadership, collective leadership, uh, which they think is Leninist. At any rate, it's certainly not Stalinist. So it's a big step forward, I think. Big step forward politically in the political evolution of this regime. There have been quite a few here. And uh, this is what Hershoff himself represents, a step forward in the evolution um, of, the, of the politics of the country. And, um, and this one is very, uh, very formidable. So after this, it's uh, Suslov with Brezhnev and, and Kosygin. And, and you hardly ever hear much from Suslov, but he's going to be really, really pulling the strings. Very important person, often overlooked in a lot of the literature about the Soviet Union. Not overlooked by me, but very much over, overlooked. And there they are, of course, with some decorative children um, um, got a greeting the comrades. And actually, Suslov does appear to be a rather authoritative person here in the leadership. Uh, he uh, seems to be standing forward very, uh, very prominently there next to Brezhnev, of course, but he's never challenging Brezhnev, uh, never humiliating him or anything like that, always praising him in public. And he's the, uh, he's the, um, he's the man who runs the Soviet Union, I, I, I would contend. 
uh, from this point on, 1964 right up until 1982. Um, immediately after they got rid of Khrushchev, uh, Rodion Molinovsky, who you see here behind all of his regalia, all of his military uh, decorations, not just the little ribbons, you know, to symbolize the decoration, but the full decoration itself, all the medals clanging around on your on your chest and you know, how you go about eating soup um, uh, under these circumstances, but there they are. Anyhow, Malinowski was the one who uh, succeeded Zhukov. He's the reliable um, conduit for political power, reliable connection to the military, the person who controls the military for the party, and uh, very faithful to this collective leadership idea. So. Um, Malinowski was in Beijing in a reception with a number of uh, Chinese officials a few months after this. He, and he got um, um, into a conversation with Zhou Enlai, uh, probably the most, um, the most uh, respected person after Mao. And he said to Zhou, uh, we got rid of our fool recently. Maybe you should get rid of yours. And uh, Joe and Lai, of course, it does not need to be asked whether he passed this on to Mao Zedong. <laughs> that the Soviets were suggesting to the Chinese leadership that they get rid of Mao. <laughs> this is not always properly taken into consideration uh, in the discussion of tension between the Soviet Union in China, but it really ought to be. Um, consider that from these years on, China is going to be digging trenches, going to be preparing to be attacked with nuclear weapons by the United States. But at the same time, it's going to be dealing with the Soviet Union that is actually capable of overthrowing Mao uh, because there are people in the leadership who look to the Soviet Union still for guidance on account of Mao, thinking of Lu Shouqi, Deng Xiaoping, people like that. Uh, you can't say they're pro-Soviet, but they certainly don't want to have a bust up with the Soviet Union and the Soviet Union is against Mao. How has Mao got to think of this? An interesting question. Um, I think this, uh, this goes a long way toward explaining a lot of what Mao did later on. We'll come back to it when we talk more about Mao. We will be increasingly from this point on. Um, but Mao is bound to be set against the superpowers anyhow from this point on because, number one, they've denied him nuclear weapons. And then number two, they've come together in 1963 and formed this test ban agreement. So presumably detente is developing among the superpowers. So where does that leave the Chinese? They're supposed to be left without nuclear weapons. Mao decided right away they have to have their own program, just as the British did uh, when the McMahon Act shut them out. You remember that in the 1940s. And the French since then, the French have done it too. So in fact, it's about this time, that roughly the same time, that the French, the Israelis, and the Chinese are all trying to build nuclear weapons. So Mao, how does he take this increasing detente that's developing between the United States and the Soviet Union that is indicated in the test ban treaty? Uh, he's got to take it as a threat. Now, you can say this is only because now Mao is Mao, and maybe you'd have a point there, but uh, perhaps we ought ought to consider as well, in the abstract, the position of Mao as head of a state such as China, revolutionary state. Uh, doesn't Mao have to worry about this increasing um, agreement between the Soviet Union and the United States? They might agree that he's troublesome. They agreed against him in a way um, in 1957, at least the Chinese argue this, that uh, they agreed in 1958 when um, um, they arrived at this deal, so to speak, as the Chinese like to call it, um, 
that's what they think happened, uh, that um, Ike decided not to give nuclear weapons to Germany in return for the Soviets not giving nuclear weapons to China. Uh, they already have worked out a deal against China is what it comes down to. So cooperation between them is bad for China. That would be the calculation. Enmity, enmity between them is good for China. Chinese don't want them cooperating. It's interesting that from this point on, Beijing Review is constantly laying down the line, the whole world would read about, that the, um, the war is on the agenda between the superpowers. War is on the agenda. They're preparing for nuclear war. It's going to happen. Um, it's almost as if it's a kind of a fulfillment for them if that happens. Not really. I think what's really being said here is that antagonism is in between the superpowers is in Chinese interest. And uh, we're not unhappy to see this antagonism. And so we see it as more or less scientifically indicated by evidence. I think is more or less the position that the Chinese come to take on this, on this sort of thing. Um, so what should the Chinese do in these circumstances? Now, follow the argument, if the argument is as we're laying it out, Mao is, has to worry about important people in his party who might take the view that um, he, Mao, is the only obstacle uh, between having good relations with the Soviet Union and having bad. Maybe they don't like bad ones. They certainly have not got used to the idea of being on antagonistic terms with the Soviet Union. So what are they, these people? Now, during the Cultural Revolution, which I think has to be said, although there's a great deal of argument about this, I would maintain the argument that cultural revolutions to get rid of these people who are favorable to the Soviets. It's a very much anti-Soviet cultural revolution that begins in 1966. That these are party people in high places taking the capitalist road. So they're the major leaders in the party. Hu Xiaoqi, Deng Xiaoping, etc. Peng Dehuai. That these people have to get be got rid of. Have to be, you know, not assassinated, executed, or anything like that. But politically they have to be defeated in the party. And they're, 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 they're enemies if they're if they're pro-Soviet. Well, that narrows down the Chinese leadership rather considerably to people who are willing to go against the country that is pretty much responsible for them being in power. So you can see that those who side with Mao are burning a lot of bridges behind them. Um, but what are you going to do? Be against Mao? Against the leader of the revolution? Quite a decision for these major leaders. Mao has enormous influence all over the country the power of the Chinese party depends on its control of the military. In fact, it built the military, so there's no trouble about controlling it, but it uh, still have to control this military. Malinovsky and his view of, uh, of the Mao leadership, that's bound to be echoed, Mao has to think, in his own military. So the Cultural Revolution can be carried out in the aegis of a military man. Lin Biao, shown here on Mao's left, your right. It'll be Mao and Lin Biao who will be leading this cultural revolution up till 1969 when the two of them fall out. Um, but it's mainly a military coup in the party, the opposite of what uh, communists are supposed to do. They're supposed to have complete control over the party. But Mao uses the military against the rest of the party, and he's going to be using his Red Guards to break the, the power of the party. So that's what we're going to see developing in China in the Cultural Revolution. Meanwhile, back in the United States, Kennedy is off the scene. Lyndon Johnson becomes president. They have to have an election in 1964. Uh, Republicans should have pulled up Nelson Rockefeller, one would think, but they didn't. They went for Barry Goldwater from Arizona. Barry Goldwater. Who is Barry Goldwater? Um, uh, a person that uh, the rest of the party, people who worked with Eisenhower, especially Rockefeller, uh, 
thought was ex an extremist. Um, he had views on economics that were hostile to the New Deal. Um, the Republicans had made their peace with Roosevelt's New Deal. They're going to try to roll it all back, as we've seen the efforts in that in that uh, in that vein. So Goldwater is the harbinger of something that's going to get much stronger in the United States, but not in 1964. And Nelson, Rock, Nelson Rockefeller at the American uh, Convention, or I should say the uh, San Francisco Convention of the Republican Party, got up and spoke openly against uh, Goldwater and said, the extremism has no place uh, in the leadership of the Republican Party. Uh, they, can't, uh, they can't send this person forward, Barry Goldwater. And Goldwater came back and said, extremism in the defense of liberty is no vice. Extremism in fighting off our enemies, or I should say moderation in fight, fighting off our enemies, is no virtue. So he didn't step back an inch from the, uh, from the accusation that he was an extremist. He did have very sharp views on a lot of things. He was way to right politically. He wouldn't be considered right in the era of Reagan or of uh, Donald Trump, but um, for, for 1964, he was way, way to the right, too right for the Republican Party. Moreover, he had made a number of statements about the military field. I don't know how he came to these things, but he was a little bit of a person who shot from the hip. Statements about how um, there, should be, there should be more um, um, uh, prerogative exercise by military commanders in the field and making decisions about the use of nuclear weapons. Awful, awful idea. You know, leave it up to the military people to decide when to use nuclear weapons. He did say things that indicated something like this. Very, very scary. So in the election, there was an enormous campaign against him. Um, and um, there was a Republican committee for for Lyndon Johnson uh, to stop Goldwater. And perhaps the same way that you see there are some Republicans that are trying to stop Donald Trump. Um, so that was his slogan, in your heart, you, you know he's right. In other words, he may not make much sense to you, but in your heart, in other words, something's pulling you. Maybe you think he's good looking. Maybe you think, I don't know, some, something other than your reason telling you you was right. And, uh, and of course, <laughs> the challenge that came back from the Democrats supporting Johnson was uh, that's something in, in your, that's something in your heart may not be telling you the right thing. Or maybe it's telling you that he's really as bad as we say. Well, at any rate, um, as a major eruption of a kind of new right in the Republican Party. We're going to see a lot more of that. So this is just the harbinger of things to come. It will be interesting that Richard Nixon will not denounce Goldwater in the same way that Rockefeller did. He'll try to make peace between both camps. He's going to profit from that. He'll get chits that he'll uh, call on uh, by 1968 and get the, uh, the Republican nomination. Uh, but uh, that was a big moment. And in that campaign, it practically emerged that Lyndon Johnson was a kind of peace candidate against a wild man alike, uh, like Barry Goldwater. And uh, Johnson won resoundingly, 61% of the vote, tremendous electoral victory. I mean, nobody voted for this guy, even in the Electoral College, which does not tell us about the popular vote. Well, 61% tells us. In the Electoral College, you can see where his strength is. It's in the Cotton South. Um, and it's also, to some degree, in his own home state and uh, some thought in Southern California and Orange County and places like that, maybe, maybe even in Texas to some degree. Uh, so that this is not just a Confederate or Bourbon South against the North uh, shown in this vote, uh, but what it is is the development of what might have been called, or what what was called at the time, the Southern Rim, meaning um, the Bourbon South, the Cotton South, 
um, previously with the Democrats, uh, but the, uh, the Cotton South going over to the Republicans now. So there they are going over to the Republicans and um, adding with them Texas and California. So that creates a, a new South, a uh, new axis of power in American politics, kind of an enormous change in American, American politics. So the peace candidate, Johnson, took power in the beginning of, uh, well, took power on his own, for his own, uh, on his own uh, term in office, inaugurated for, a, for his own term in the beginning of 96. No sooner was he inaugurated than he, he took up uh, the bombing of North Vietnam. So up to that time, Jack Kennedy had sent some 14,000 or so troops into South Vietnam. He'd argued that there has, this had to be fought with special forces, anti-guerrilla campaigns, big conventional units um, that probably wouldn't do the job. That it was a new kind of war. Um, the army had to train new people, special forces, Green Berets. Um, and that's the way the war had to be fought. And it would have to be a long, drawn-out thing um, to win over the, uh, the, South, the uh, South Vietnamese ideologically against communists. Uh, so that was Kennedy's view of the matter. He was quite stern about it and uh, wrote about it, was very serious about it. It's Cold War liberalism, no getting around it. And uh, maybe Kennedy would have continued in Spain, but who knows, after the American University speech, it makes sense to ask the question, uh, which has been asked, and I don't think a real definite answer could ever be really given to it, but to ask the question whether Kennedy wouldn't have counted his losses and got out of Vietnam. One thing I can say for certain, just as I can say that Franklin Roosevelt never would have got involved in trying to save the French in Indochina. Uh, I'm just as much convinced in my estimation of things that JFK would never have got us up to 600,000 troops in South Vietnam, as Lyndon Johnson was shortly to do. It all begins in 1965 with this bombing in the North. And now bombing in the North is now introducing a new equation into this thing. We're not going to leave the North alone. We're not just going to fight in the South. The North is the real center of communist power. We have to put the heat on them. Can't invade very well, but at least we can go after them and bomb them. So dropping ordnance on their capital, maybe on their dikes of the Red River, it might cause flooding and you know, kinds of atrocious things. What we did in North Korea gives a kind of an idea of what we might be able to do to North Vietnam with, uh, with bombing. That introduces a brand new moment in this thing. Everyone had the idea, and I shouldn't say everyone, but great many people had the idea that Johnson was not as wild about Vietnam as uh, Goldwater, that he represented some kind of peace alternative. Dead wrong, we turned out to be. Dead wrong. Johnson was dedicated, down to his boots, more than anyone, to fight to the death, to defeat the communists in Vietnam. Could it be done? Well, maybe with all this bombing. Maybe we hadn't been mean enough. Maybe we'd been squeamish about bombing, killing people, death from the air, killing innocents. Maybe if we got a little tough, after all, the communists were tough, weren't they? Maybe if we were as tough as they, we could do, uh, we could do things. And you know, um, there was a certain scientific argument behind all this bombing that, you know, if nuclear weapons were good for deterrence, as to say, if they kept the enemy from attacking us with nuclear weapons, they had to be good for compellence as well as deterrence. Argument laid out by Thomas Schelling, Harvard, in his famous book, Strategy of Conflict. This is the real Henry, Henry Kissinger. The Henry Kissinger was trained by Thomas Schelling in game theory and in bargaining and all the rest of that. Nuclear weapons in foreign policy. That's the thing Henry Kissinger understood better than anybody. 
it could uh, it seemed to be more subtle and more clever with uh, than anybody and not in broad geopolitical visions not in understanding the world particularly uh, although he claimed that too but this was his real strong point uh, the stuff that thomas Schelling uh, taught at harvard and that kissinger learned learned from Schelling. and johnson was going to take us down the road of bombing in Vietnam, whether we liked it or not. Nobody liked it, the idea of bombing Vietnam. We thought we were going in the opposite direction. Johnson was going to pull, he had a big mandate now, so he's gonna pull us along in this enormous thing. How was the American public going to take this now? How about the people who are gonna to have to fight this war, even though they're bombing away, they still need troops. And Johnson is going to be saying that we're gonna to have to put in not tens of thousands of troops, not troops in division strength, but hundreds of thousands of troops. And we'll end up with more than half a million troops. And they'll have to be draftees, draftees. Hmm, very interesting. That's how the Chinese think of the United States. Not a very nuanced view of the matter, but there it is. They're bound to think that way. And uh, this is the way the British tend to think of it, that it's a series of dominoes. And uh, it leads from Vietnam to Thailand to Malaysia, Singapore, Indonesia, which is a communist regime at this time. So let's see, should I continue talking about this or should I break things off? Perhaps it's a good idea to break things off at this point. 1965, perhaps you could make the argument that 1965 is the real breaking point in the 60s. Todd Gitlin tries to argue against this. He says it's uh, bad to talk about the good early 60s and the bad late 60s. Uh, but maybe there's a big difference anyhow, though. Maybe don't say good and bad, but uh, maybe there's a big difference between the political attitudes on the left, the criticism of uh, the Vietnam War. Attitudes toward the Cold War is what we're really centering, centering on. Uh, maybe that's the point. There's a big difference before 1965 and after this. So what happened in 65 that's so big? This bombing and all of its implications, as we'll indicate maybe maybe next time, for the uh, uh, for the domino theory, and especially as it regards Indonesia. So we have to talk about Indonesia and the British uh, in this part of the world, Malaysia, Singapore, all the rest of that. And on the other hand, uh, the civil rights movement in the United States, which also undergoes a big change in 1965. Prior to 1965, civil rights is a nonviolent movement inspired by Gandhi, led by Martin Luther King. It's a, uh, it's a movement mostly in the South. It's not have a major Northern participation, participation by Northern blacks in Northern cities. Uh, but that's when it all changed in 1965 with the Watts Rebellion uh, section of South Central Los Angeles. Watts rose up in rebellion, black neighborhood, uh, street fighting, burning, Molotov cocktails, a new escalation in the civil rights movement. In fact, Many stopped calling it the civil rights movement at this point, started saying it's a black revolution. So big changes after 1965. Maybe we shouldn't take them up today, but take them up uh, on the next uh, block, next discussion on this matter. We've already gone on at some length up to this point. Um, so next time, uh, the bad 60s, the revolutionary 60s, how should we put it? The liberal 60s, from 1960 to 65, revolutionary 60s, from 1965 to 1970. That for, that for next time.